Amen. It's going to be a good day in the house of the Lord. Already a powerful time of worship this morning. And uh, our message, our sermon this morning is entitled, No Man is an Island. But ironically, this sermon was birthed and mostly written in the mountains, interestingly. In fact, I was uh, in the mountains more than usual this year. I was privileged to spend a lot of time in the mountains. It's one of my favorite places on earth. And as I was on an overlook in the mountains uh, not long ago in prayer in the morning, this scripture from the psalmist came to mind. Psalm 121 says, I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. This morning I'd like to talk about our need for help. You know, for the psalmist to say, I look up to the mountaintop, where does my help come from? That must mean that he was where? In the valley low. I wonder if you've ever been where the psalmist was when he wrote this. I wonder if you've ever traveled through that valley of the shadow of death. I wonder if you've ever been at the end of your rope, out of options, out of hope, in need of some help. Well, if you have, if you've been at the end of your rope, I would say if you feel that this morning you are at the end of your rope, then I've got good news for you. Jesus says this to you this morning. You're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you, there's more of God and His rule. I would add more of God and His grace more of God and His mercy, His loving kindness, His faithfulness, more room for God's help in your life. I've been at the end of my rope before, literally at the end of a rope. I, uh, some of you know this about me, I'm an avid waterfowl hunter. I enjoy the outdoors, and in the wintertime in Missouri, the outdoors means, well, for me, duck hunting. And so, uh, me and a buddy of mine, I'm going to call him Joe this morning to protect his reputation, and you'll see why here in just a moment. But my friend Joe and I, we were out, uh, not in the wintertime, but in the summertime, testing out our new duck boat. And let me tell you, this boat was a little boat with a big motor. We had just bought a brand new, big, long tail motor. So you've got a little boat with a big motor, and we were going out on the Kansas River, and uh, we, we load up the boat, we head to the river, we get to the boat ramp, and I jump in the truck, he jumps in the boat, and I back down the boat ramp, let him out, and I pull back up into the parking lot. As I park the truck, I'm walking back down the boat ramp, and my buddy Joe is uh, doing figure eights in the middle of the Kansas River with our brand new little boat with a big motor, and he's having a blast, right? He's like, he's standing up in the back, he's got the handle, he's just just chopping water, doing figure eights. There's wake everywhere. He, and he yells out, "Woo!" You know, he's having a blast. And here I am walking on the boat ramp like, great, you know, here we go. This is going to be an interesting day. I'm excited. Uh, and, and just in a moment, like, have you ever had one of those things that happened like in the moment it felt like it took forever, but you know that it happened in a split second? You know, those kind of accidents in life? That's what happens here. Uh, my buddy Joe takes a hard left, but when he does... He hits a sandbar that he didn't see under the water, and it tips the boat towards the current. So he hits a sandbar, the boat gets tipped towards the current, and let, may I remind you that this is a little boat with a big motor, and all of a sudden the current comes over the side of the boat and sucks our new boat to the bottom of the Kansas River. So there is my buddy Joe. Now, Thank goodness it was a somewhat of a sandbar. Now, this is not a shallow sandbar. It, it knocked him loose. So he's in some deep water, but he's able to keep the boat under his feet, and the water is about to his chest. And he's looking at me as all of our stuff that was in the boat is flowing down the river, never to be seen again, like somebody help, right? And here I am standing on the boat, dock, the boat ramp, and I think, I got I to gotta get 
some help here. I'm, so I move into action. I'm pretty good under pressure with clarity. I think, okay, as soon as I can, because that boat's not going to stay in the same place. This is a river, not a lake. And so there's a strong current. He's up to his chest. I got to do something quick. I run back to the, to the truck and come to find out there's like nothing left in the truck except a tow rope and a little kid's life vest. Now, it's not one of those like life vests that are the new kind that, you know, like when you hit water, it inflates or like, you know, the kind that straps around for like ski dudes or whatever, you know, wave runners, whatever they're called these days. No, this is one of those old school vests. I think it was actually from the 70s, you know, when you had kids camp and you went out on the canoe and it went around your neck with the little strap that, yeah, one of those, like, how does that save your life? I never understood those, but Anyway, I grab the life vest, I grab the tow rope, I run down the boat ramp, and I get back, and the boat has shifted, and now the water is up to Joe's neck, and he's barely hanging on. He's got, he's on his tippy toes, and the boat's right underneath his feet, and he's pushing himself up against the current, and so I'm looking at Joe, I'm looking at myself, I got new jeans on, by the way, and I make a decision in a split second to strip down to my skibbies and put on that kitty life vest and tie that rope to a piece of rebar sticking out of the side of the, uh, the boat ramp. And I figure, well, it's Kansas, so there's no one around. It's a little Kansas joke. Uh, sorry if you're from Kansas, we love you, Scotty. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm in my underwear with a kitty life vest, by the way, bright blue and white stripes, with a rope. My buddy's in need of help. So I jump in the Kansas River, and I'm like, Lord, multiply this rope, because he's on the other side. And I swim, and I get halfway across the river, and I'm where? At the end of my rope. So I follow the rope back to shore. As I'm getting out of the water, I stand up, and I look at the boat. I look up the boat ramp, and there's a gentleman standing at the top of the boat ramp. Boy, it looks like you guys could use some what? Help. (laughs) I said, yes, sir. Well, you see, what happened was, he said, no need, I saw the whole thing. (laughs) Remember, I'm in my underwear with a kitty life vest on. This is not a pretty sight. He goes, oh, yeah, I was just over there on the bank on this beautiful day taking pictures. Great. Awesome. Thanks. Long story short, he went back, got some more rope and a kayak, and uh, by the time we got back to Derek, he was just barely keeping his head above water, and somehow, by the grace of God, we were able to pull that boat out of the water, and all is well. I wonder if you've ever been at the end of your rope in need of some help. We don't like to talk about help, though, do we? It's not a popular subject. We like to put on a show in our culture. It seems to be our cultural norm to put on this show of self-sufficiency, that we are capable people, that we are whole, that all is well. But if we're honest, at times we all need help. We all come to the end of our rope. We all come to the place where we are out of options and we feel that we have no hope. And if you don't need help right now, there will come a time in life when you do. Even our heroes need help at times. I want to talk about one of the greatest heroes of our heritage of faith, King David. You know the story of King David, don't you? Well, you probably know the most famous story of David. If, you, if I were to invite you all over to my house, we were hanging out in my living room, um, playing a word association game, like catchphrase or something like that, and, and I said the word David, you would probably re- reply with David and Goliath. Very good. David and Goliath, you got it. You didn't let me down. That would have been awkward if you would have said, I don't know, Bathsheba. <laughs> Just been awkward. No, David and Goliath, that's right. 
David and Goliath, that's the, the giant that David conquered, right? Everyone knows that story. We've got paintings of that story, sculptures. We want to celebrate the heroic actions of our heroes, the times when they are conquering their giants. But what happens when our heroes need help? We don't talk as much about those stories. Yeah, everyone has heard about the giant that David has conquered, but many of us possibly have never heard of the giant that David could not conquer. This is the story not of David and Goliath, but rather the story of David and Ishbi Binab. Now, if you are a young married couple here and you're looking for names, you know, you're choosing names for your children, that may be one to put in the hat, Ishbi Binab. Have you noticed everyone's trying to look for unique names these days, names that no one else is? There's one. I don't know anyone named Ishbi Binab. There's another person in our story I'll throw at you for free, Abishai. So you've got two options there, uh, young ladies, Ishbi Binab, Abishai. Uh, I thought Ishbi Binab, Abishai Taylor would be a great, strong Bible name if we uh, ever decided to have a second child and it was a boy. Anyway, let's move on before I get in trouble with my wife this morning. <laughs> Second Samuel chapter 21 verse 15 recounts the story of David and Ishbi Binab. There was war again between the Philistines and Israel. Note that this is not the first time that the Israelites and the Philistines have been at war. One of the first times that we hear about the war between the Philistines and the Israelites is, in fact, the story of David and Goliath, where David comes in as the hero, a little shepherd boy who brings his brother's lunch and cannot stand to hear his God being blasphemed by this giant, and he trusts in the Lord, and he grabs those pebbles, and he says, now this armor doesn't fit. You know the story. He goes out there with what God has been faithful to use in his life, and he conquers the giant. He becomes a hero to the people of Israel and eventually king, and yet that king is at war once again with the Philistines. And it says that David went down together with his servants, and they fought against the Philistines, and David, the hero, grew weary. And Ishbi Binab, can we all say that? That's just a fun word. Ishbi Binab. Would you say that with me? Ishbi Binab. Yeah, it's a good one. And Ishbi Binab, one of the descendants of the giants whose spear weighed 300 shekels of bronze, who was armed with a new sword, thought to kill David. But Abishai, now I know that that's actually pronounced Abishai, but I'm from the south. And uh, I think it's just a better way to say it. Abishai, it's got some power to it. So, but Abishai, the son of Zariah, came to his aid and attacked the Philistine and killed him. The words that stand out to me this morning from this story are those three words. David grew weary. David grew weary. I believe that there are some of you here this morning who have grown weary. In fact, you may be seen as a hero. A hero in your family, at your workplace, even here in your church. You're the strong one. At the office, you're the one everyone looks to for leadership. Among your friends and family, you're the one who has it all together. You're the one they asked to pray for Thanksgiving dinner when the whole family's around. You're the hero. And yet, you, like David, find yourself this morning at a place where you have grown weary, weary in your faith, weary in your marriage, weary with work. You're at a place this morning where you need some help. You've come to realize that the giants in life don't just show up on the strong days, right? The giants don't show up when your faith is strong. They also show up when you are weary. On your weak days, on your days that are full of doubt and darkness, the giants show up on those days as well. But I'd like to remind you this morning that in our weariness, the words of Psalms 46.1 ring true today as they ever did for King David. God is our refuge and strength. In your weariness, know that God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. 
Our God is not a God who is absent in trouble. Though it may feel that He is far away, though it may feel that He has abandoned you, forsaken you in time of trouble, it may feel that God is absent. But let me tell you that we serve a God who is very present, a very present help in time of trouble. He is not a God who is unacquainted with sorrow and suffering and pain, but rather God in Christ is intimately acquainted with pain and suffering, even weariness. If we recount the journey of Jesus on the Via Della Rosa, the way of sorrow, that road to Golgotha, carrying His cross, God, the maker of heaven and earth, in Christ, as a man carrying the weight of his cross, comes to a place where he, like King David, grows weary, and he collapses under the weight of his cross. The cross that Jesus is carrying becomes a cross that he can no longer bear. And you know the story, the Roman soldiers there, they command Simon of Cyrene, a bystander, to come and carry that cross for Christ. When we are facing the giants of life which we cannot conquer, when we are carrying the crosses in life which we cannot bear, when we come to the end of our rope, we are in the perfect place for God to show Himself as our very present help in time of trouble. He's not an absent God in times of trouble. He is present. Amen? Amen. Unfortunately, sometimes we get so focused on the frightfulness of our giants that we lose sight of the faithfulness of our God. That was good. I'm going to say that again just so you can get that. Oftentimes in life, we get so focused on the frightfulness of our giants, the fear, the anxiety, the worry, the insecurities that come along with facing these giants which seem insurmountable in our lives. We're so focused on the frightfulness of our giants that we lose sight of the faithfulness of our God. The author of Lamentation writes so beautifully to remind us of this faithfulness. In chapter 3, he says, Remember my affliction and my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall. My soul continually remembers it and is bowed down within me. But I call this to mind. My hope for you this morning is if you feel like you are facing affliction and wanderings, the wormwood and the gall, that I could bring some things to mind for you this morning through the author of Lamentations. He says, I bring these things to mind and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. And therefore, I will hope in Him. If you are in the midst of wanderings and afflictions, at the end of your rope, look around you this morning. You're in the perfect place. You've come to the place where our God, a very present help in time of trouble, is here this morning. In His people, He is present. I've I've come to find that if anything is true, that God is good and He is faithful. And His goodness and His faithfulness is often revealed through the helping hands of His people. God's goodness His faithfulness, which is as sure as the rising of the sun in the east every single morning, that is how faithful our God is. That goodness and faithfulness is often revealed, shown true through the helping hands of His people. The church is called His body, His hands, His feet, the ones who are busy doing the work of Jesus being that help which he is sending into the world. And the beauty of the church is that when you grow weary, you are not alone. That's a part of the beauty of the church. 
Our pastor wrote a book called Beauty Will Save the World and that the church is called to be a beautiful place, that we are a city on a hill, a light shining in the darkness. And a part of that beauty, I believe, is the fact that when we grow weary, we look to our left, our right, before us and behind us, and we find that we have a Simon or an Abishai, that we walk into this place week after week and we are reminded that we are not alone. And this is why I believe that simply showing up to church week after week is so important. Oftentimes I hear people say, well, I'm not going to church anymore. I'm just not getting fed, right? I mean, that's, at times we go through seasons where we feel like we're not getting much from church. But can I tell you that your being here this morning is not just about getting something, but that you sitting in that pew this morning means that there is a place where those who are among us who are in desperate need of help, those who have come to the end of their rope, who have grown weary, they came this morning and there is a room full of people that says, you are not alone. In the midst of their weariness, they look before them and behind them to their left and to their right and they find that Christ present in his people is all around them. That God is their very present help in time of trouble. The beauty of the church is that when you grow weary, you are not alone. We are called to be Simon of Cyrene's and Abishai's to those among our community who are in places of trouble and help. Amen. I believe this so deeply because it's been the story of my life. I've experienced personally the goodness and faithfulness of God in the helping hands of his people. Growing up in church, I was reflecting on my life and I, I found that I was surrounded by Abishai's and Simon of Cyrene's. I'd just like to take a few moments to recount my story with you, to testify to the goodness and faithfulness of God in my life. I grew up in church in Atlanta, Georgia. I just got to go back there for a buddy's wedding, and I was reminded of how Southern I really am. I love fried food, everything fried. I'm like, give it, yeah, pickles, I'll take them. Chicken, yes. Fried chitlins, I love them. His Mexicans like to call them tripitas. I love tripitas tacos. If you fix tripitas tacos, I would love you forever if I could try your tacos. I love everything fried from the South. I grew up in church. I had a mama who took me to church. Can we say amen for the mamas who take their kids to church? Woo! My dad worked a lot. God bless his soul. He was providing for a family. We struggled financially, but my mom, we only had one car, of course, but Sunday came. Dad was at work, so my mom said, we got to get these kids in church. So she put on, remember this is the mid-80s, she put on some high-top Reeboks, Anybody remember those high-top Reeboks? And then she added to those high-top Reeboks those athletic socks that went up to your knees and then you scrunched them down so you had the high-top Reeboks, all white, of course, and then the big scrunchy socks. Mind you, she was wearing all of that with a floral dress, walking down the highway with a stroller with two kids, going to church. Oh, I love my mom. And she got us into church. And there I learned about the faithfulness of God, the goodness of God. We used to say in church, God is good, and we would reply, all the time, He is good. I grew up in a church like that, thankful for a church like that. But the mom who brought me to church faced a struggle with substance abuse in life. Around the age of 10, my parents divorced, and that was tragic. It left me crushed with insecurities, wondering where I belong and if I fit, and if love is real. If my parents' love didn't last, then how could any other love last? Because it's the greatest love that I had ever known in life was the love of my parents, and that fell apart. And then the, old, old, the, the, the love of my mother began to, to wane as she became tangled up in substance abuse, and her life spiraled out of control into a life of chaos. At the age of 40, she ends up homeless and pregnant. I hadn't spoken to her in months, even years possibly, except just a high and by. And as a child, I felt abandoned. I felt insecure. This was at the age of 11 years old, going into 12 years old. This is the time of life when you are Finding who you are in life, building your own identity, establishing your place in the world, 
And I felt like I had no place in the world. I felt abandoned, which left me full of insecurity going into my teenage years and even into adulthood. And I carried that insecurity with me. But I had some Abishai's in my life that in the midst of life when I felt crushed, abandoned, without hope, I had some saints that came along the way, some agents of God's help in my life. I had more, I mean, I had a lot. If I could go through the list this morning, we'd be here till tomorrow night, but I'm not going to do that. I chose three this morning. The first saint that I like to call her Saint Jackie. I've talked about her before here at Word of Life. She was just a young college student who, decide, who saw two little kids going through hell at home. A young boy at 12 years old and a little girl who was nine years old. And we had Wednesday night church with youth group and children's ministry, much like midweek at Word of Life. And Jackie decided, I don't know how to fix their situation, but I believe that I can help in any way I can. And she said, I don't have much. I live with my parents. I'm going to school, but I have a car. And I've got enough money for gas. So she offered to take my sister and I to church week after week to get us into youth group. And it's at that place that I learned again and again that God is good and God is faithful. And week after week, Jackie would drive 30 minutes out of her way to pick us up, 30 minutes back to the church, 30 minutes to bring us home, and then 30 minutes back. Two hours a week, this young lady gave up her life to make sure we were in church. She's a saint in my life, an Abishai. She's one of my Simon of Cyrene's. And it was in that place, I was in youth group, when the second saint didn't enter my life. He was like a brother to me. We grew up together. He used to be a pastor here for years. You guys know Pastor Shay Strickland. Yeah. So Shay and I grew up together. He was at the hospital when I was born. He was a part of my family. And he had gone away to college and come back to preach at youth group that he grew up in. You know, it's like the, the, the star child comes home. He was leading ministries in college, and I looked up to him. I thought he, like, had just, like, conquered life. As the young people say, he was goals for me. Like, that was goals for me, Shay. He comes back, and he preaches a sermon, and I'm so proud of him. I'm proud to know him. But then afterwards, he came back. I remember right where I was sitting in the room like this. I was sitting right there, and he came back, and I was sitting there because I was struggling with a lot. So I just kind of distanced myself from people. As they were leaving, I hung behind. He came over. He sat down next to me, and he said, hey, can I pray for you? Okay. You know people usually don't say no if you ask to pray for them. He puts his arm around me, and he begins to pray. And as he prayed, he began to speak words into my life that I never forgot. I mean, people say a lot of things in life, right? But the, there's some things people say, both positive and negative, that we, they're seared in our memory. We cannot forget those words. These words have power, the power of life and death. And he spoke words of life. He said, I believe that God has called you to be a leader. I believe that he's going to use you as an instrument of the kingdom of God here on the earth to, to send out the good news of Jesus around the world. I believe this with all of my heart, Jacob. He began to pray over me that you are, you know, you are not the tail, you are the head. And he just began to speak life over me. And I hung on to that. And then he put actions with words. I was in a mess my senior year of high school, five years later, after that amazing time of prayer, I was sowing my wild oats, as they say. Lord have mercy. And he knew it. And he said, no, 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 no. You, you're not this young man. I, I believe that God's called you to be more. And he comes to Georgia from Missouri. He was working at Word of Life Church. And he said, hey, we've got this ministry school at Word of Life called Oxano. Anybody remember Oxano? Master's Commission. And he said, I think you need to sign up. I said, I don't think you know, like, I think you know me from five years ago. Like, I'm a trouble child. <laughs> like, I'm a wild child. I should not be in ministry school at any church. I should just be in church. <laughs> no. No, no, no. He goes, no, I think you really need to look at this. In fact, I, I'm, I've already signed you up, so you're going to get a call what? He's like, yeah, I believe God's called you, and he's still calling you, and I'm not going to lie. I moved out to St. Joseph, Missouri here at Word of Life Church as a student who didn't believe in himself, full of insecurity, abandonment issues, rejection issues, and yet this church opened its arms to me and said, we believe that God has a call on your life, and they equipped me, and they taught me. 
Shay even opened up his home to me during the summers to live with him. These were saints in my life. I couldn't be here where I am in life without them. And lastly, just to bring the whole story around, this is who I call Saint Stranger. After a couple years here at Word of Life, I went to Oral Roberts University in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where I participated in missions. And I was uh, on a missions trip to Russia. And on my way home, we had flown through South Korea. And (laughs) this is a really funny story. So if you feel like things are heavy, they're about to lighten up. I was on a plane from South Korea, 15-hour flight back to the United States from a missions trip. And we boarded the plane, and I'm sitting there in the seat next to my assistant team leader. And I was, you know, here in the middle seat. She had the window seat. And then the aisle seat was open. Praise God. I was so excited. But this is the greatest mystery of all. The mystery of the open airplane seat. Have you ever felt that mystery? You're sitting there like, I wonder. And when it's a 15-hour flight, you are really curious who's going to be sitting next to you for the next 15 hours. And it's getting later and later. And the boarding's coming to an end, and the seat is still empty. And I'm thinking, there is a God in heaven because he has given us the extra seat on a 15-hour flight. And then I felt like God had just abandoned me. (laughs) Because the, the, the... The event unfolds that you hear as they're beginning to close the doors. You hear this noise at the front of the airplane. A ruckus is happening, and this man stumbles onto this airplane full of humble, quiet, polite South Koreans. They're the nicest people in the world. And here comes a white, middle-aged American man. No, he was a young man. He was in his 20s. He was an army man, a golden glove boxer. He was big, and he was loud, and he was very drunk. And he stumbles onto the airplane, I'm here, I'm here, don't leave, don't leave. And he finds his way, he's coming back, and I'm thinking, no, 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 it can't, no, no. Yes, yes, he's sitting next to me. Airplane full of quiet, humble, polite South Koreans are all staring at the loud, drunken, white American man who's sitting next to me. So now what do they think? Oh, you guys are together. (laughs) You're friends. We're not friends. He's so drunk, guys. And he turns to me, and you know, he's got proximity issues. So he's right in my face, saying, hey, what are you doing here? Well, I'm on a missions trip, coming home. Oh, my God, the Lord works in mysterious ways. I was just in a bar, and now I'm on an airplane next to a Christian. And on and on it goes. There's a long story, but I'm going to cut it short. I somehow ended up praying for him, and he's weeping. He's very drunk still. He ends up singing Ray Bolts at the top of his lungs on this airplane at some point, and then passes out. Thank God. I was grateful for the ministry opportunity, but he's out cold. Four hours later, he wakes up. Still a bit drunk, I'm not going to lie. Very drunk. But Remember two weeks ago, Pastor Brian talks about being mystics, encountering God, having experiences with God. This is my story. It really happened. But he begins to look at my assistant team leader and I, and he begins to speak to her about a conversation we had the night before about a struggle she was facing going home and saying, God's got you, and, he belie- and I believe, and he wants you to know that he's going to carry you through that and that you should move forward with that. And it's like, what are you talking about? And then he turns to me, and he looks me square in the face, and he says, you, you've got something to say, don't you? No, sir. (laughs) No, 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 no. You've got something to say, don't you? Starts hitting me in the chest. You've got something to say, don't you? I said, "Uh, yeah, I mean, I feel like, you know, speak up for the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, yeah, you got something to say, he says, but you're afraid to say it. You're afraid to say it. And when he said that, all of those insecurities, the fear of rejection from my childhood, from the the issues of abandonment that I suffered, from my mother leaving us, all of that came flooding over me. And he said, yeah, 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 but God wants you to know you're not going to be afraid anymore. And he says, now I want you to say it. What? Yeah, say it. Everyone's sleeping. You're not going to be afraid anymore. I said, I'm not going to be afraid anymore. No, no, say it like you mean it. I'm not going to be afraid anymore. No, I want you. He makes me yell this at the top of my lungs. I'm not going to be afraid anymore. That was my saint stranger. 
My senior year, two years later, I was invited to speak at our chapel in front of the whole school on Missions Chapel, and um, I was terrified. I stood backstage with my notes. My hands were trembling. They were about to introduce me, and I felt like um, I was not right for this job, that I was going to be rejected, that I was going to fail, fumble. I, I was terrified. Two years later, I hadn't really thought about these words, and I hear whispered in my soul, you're not going to be afraid anymore. Perfect peace came over me. In my time of trouble, it was like the very present help of God was there, and I went out, and I felt like I was right where I was supposed to be. I felt at home, at peace, like the Lord had me, and he did, and he has ever since. I haven't always been on the mountaintop. There's valley lows in life, but God is never absent. He's very present. Amen? Amen.